Thanks for coming to listen to my talk about post-contextual banded inference. This is work that's joined with Aurelien, Antoine, Maria, and Mark. And so to tell you about post-contextual banded inference, let me first talk, tell you about contextual bandits so that we're all starting from the same page. Contextual bandits are a model for decision-making in unknown environments where we're learning about the environment at the same time that we're making decisions and collecting rewards. And it goes like this, for every time step t, equals to one, two, up to capital T, we're gonna encounter an individual drawn from a stationary distribution of individuals. Uh, the individual is gonna be characterized by some baseline covariates xt that are available to us at the time of making a decision, and some potential outcomes unavailable to us, which corresponds to the reward we would see if we took any one of the m action options available to us. And so imagine a doctor that's waiting to see a sequence of patients. Each patient is associated with some variables uh, like their blood pressure, their age, etc. And based on this information, she wants to choose the best treatment option 1 through M for that individual. Uh, so that decision, AT, is going to be a function pi, pi for policy, of the context, because we want to make the best decision in the context, possibly some randomization, because that can come in helpful. Uh, and all of the historical data so far on context, action, and outcome from that action up to time t and excluding time t. So I'm going to call all of this h sub t minus 1, and this represents all the data we have so far, time t, from which we can learn about this distribution that's unknown to us. After taking an action, we get to see the reward yt corresponding to the action that we took. We don't get to see any of the uh, outcomes that, we, that correspond to actions that we did not take. And there's banded algorithms that try to optimize the cumulative sum of rewards we collect over this horizon. There are banded algorithms that try to optimize the policy we learn at the very end. And all of these offer opportunities to improve on non-adaptive randomized trials. And indeed, in a lot of applied fields, whether development econ or biostatistics, where we would usually use randomized trials to learn about uh, different treatment options, there's been this push to replace them with bandits because we can uh, both improve the outcomes for the trial participants and or improve the policies learned at the end of the trial. The problem is that whenever we're interested in more than just the regret, but actually learning something from the trial, then we want to actually conduct statistical inference, but bandits break statistical inference. Right? At the end of the trial, we still want to make credible conclusions about the values of different arms or different policies, so we want to conduct statistical inference, that is, construct valid confidence intervals. But here, with bandits, we're adaptively changing the arm allocations. They're no longer independent. And that's going to break the asymptotics of the usual estimators and lead to wrong confidence intervals. So to illustrate this to you, uh, I'll show you this in a simple example. So here I'm considering just a uh, two-arm contextual bandit where the conditional expectation of rewards given context is a linear function. And I'm running a epsilon greedy algorithm where the epsilon is one over square root t, so slowly decaying flourishing, and I'm looking at capital T of 500, and here I'm looking at the average regret over 10,000 replications, and we see a familiar sublinear uh, curve for the regret. Now at the end of the trial, we want to you know, learn something, we want to make some inference. So maybe we want to understand uh, what are the, what would be the mean reward marginally of arm plus one. So if this were a randomized trial, the way we would assess that is by looking at the mean reward among the sample that received arm plus one. So it will be the sample mean among arm plus one individuals reward. Uh, now, if I actually do this in this uh, ex experiment that I'm showing you, I get the following histogram for what I would get for the sample mean over those 10,000 replications. The true, the true marginal mean is actually zero, but the sample means that we see are biased upward. And why is that? Well, when are we pulling arm plus one? We're pulling arm plus one when we think it's good. So the outcomes that we see for arm plus one are usually bigger than the marginal mean. Right? So it's biased upward. To fix this, we have to correct for this bias sampling of arm plus one. And the way we can do that, one way you can do that, is using importance sampling. So if we were to use importance sampling or an inverse uh, propensity weighting, we would look at the average of the outcomes among uh, individuals treated with treatment one, but we would upweight them by the inverse probability of their being treated with treatment one. Right? So here we're conditioning both on their context and on the history because uh, 
we're in an adaptive setting where this probability also depends on the history. So it's a condition on both. This actually fixes the bias. Our estimates are now unbiased, but at the same time, they don't look very normal. They have kind of a sort of a fat tail over here and they look somewhat skewed. Indeed, if we were to try and construct confidence intervals around this estimate by adding plus minus two standard errors, well, that's designed, say, for 95% uh, uh, coverage, right? If we're adding plus minus two standard errors, but that would only yield us 80% coverage. If we wanted 80% coverage, we would only get 70% coverage. And it's not that it's always undercovered, then we could always just expand it. It's that the coverage is completely unpredictable. This is one example. In another example, we might be over covering. For example, what if we try to improve this by, say, using the W robust estimator, the DR estimator? Here we would be centering by the conditional expectation, and maybe this would improve things, right? So the conditional expectation here is this function f of both action and uh, context x, which is the conditional expectation of the potential outcome of action a, given the context is x. And if we take the FEW estimator, but recenter things in terms of conditional expectation, we arrive at the W robust estimator. And here I'm really giving it the benefit of the doubt by letting it use the true conditional expectation, not even fitting it. So the estimator that we get is still unbiased, but still not very normal, right? The coverage is very unpredictable, and it's hard for us to construct valid confidence intervals with uh, the coverage that we're actually designing them for. So what's the issue? Well, both these estimators, IPW and DR, they're both unbiased. And W robust remains unbiased even if we plug in estimates of F, as long as these estimates are based only on the history so far H. Right? It's sort of a cross-fitting across time. The problem is that each one of those terms that we're averaging over has uh, violently different variances. Why? Because when we run a bandit, we're always letting exploration diminish slowly. If we're letting exploration diminish slowly, that means that for larger t, the overlap between the action that we want to evaluate and the action that was taken historically is going to diminish to zero, and the variance is going to grow, uh, is, is going to grow with t. And this sort of average of random variables with uh, uh, very different variances is exactly what breaks uh, the conditions of the central limit theorem or even martingale CLT in this case, right? Because we have things uh, uh, being drawn adaptively. So we have to think about things as martingales. So the solution I'm going to explore in this talk is stabilizing this estimator using reweighting. Specifically, I'm going to develop the contextual adaptive W robust estimator, which proceed as follows. First, we're gonna sequentially estimate these ALCA models in order to approximate the DR estimator, just as I was alluding to in the second bullet. Then we're going to sequentially estimate the conditional variance of each one of these terms in the DR estimator, conditioned on the history. Okay, and then we're going to reweight each term by the inverse of the estimated conditional standard deviation. And we're going to show that uh, this is going to guarantee us asymptotic normality. Once we have asymptotic normality, constructing confidence intervals is really easy, just plus minus two standard errors. And then I'm going to show you on an experiment using 57 different data sets that this actually gives us the inference we want, whereas uh, a lot of standard estimators are gonna give us wrong confidence intervals. So first I just wanna note that this idea of stabilizing in order to fix CLT, uh, this builds on uh, some past successes, notably Ludke and van der Laan, they use stabilization in a completely different setting uh, where data is IID in order to do inference. And more recently Haddad et al, uh, use stabilization in order to do inference in a multi-arm bandit trial, right? So they were looking in a non-contextual bandit problem, and essentially what we're doing here is extending uh, their idea to the contextual setting. There are some key challenges to this extension. One is that Haddad et al., their weights, their stabilization weights, were actually known. Here, we have to stabilize using estimated weights, and we have to make sure that that stabilization still works we also have to actually estimate these weights. And that's uh, a, a hard problem by itself. In order to do so, we also have to learn contextual ACO models from adaptive data. So those are all key challenges that are sort of unique to this extension to contextual problems. Uh, there's also some other related work that's trying to do, uh, to deal with the adaptively collected data. Howard et al. Uh, constructs finite sample concentration bounds in order to construct these confidence intervals. 
But because they're based on concentration bounds, they're going to be far too conservative. Uh, in particular, they're not going to be calibrated. So if we want 95% uh, coverage, we will always way over cover. Uh, more recently, Cato uh, looked at doing inference uh, that's calibrated, but they do not allow the exploration to vanish towards zero, and correspondingly, the method is, uh, is quite simpler. So first, let me define the estimand on which we will uh, run inference. So before I just mentioned the marginal mean reward of an arm, but we can do something that's much more general. Look at an estimand psi naught given by any weighted average of the uh, potential outcomes. Okay, so the weights are going to be given by this reference g star, which is a function of action and context. For example, if we wanted to look at the average treatment effect, or the ATE, we would look at g star equal to 1 if the action is, you know, maybe action 2, and minus 1 for some other action. And then we're looking at the average treatment effect between these two actions. Or we can think about evaluating some counterfactual policy, g star, and then g star is just the probability of taking an action in a given context. And the way we're going to estimate this estimate is by taking the DR estimator and stabilizing it. So first we have to make some definitions to construct the DR estimator. First we define GT to be the policy that the bandit used at time t. Essentially it's the uh, distribution assigned to action at time t given any one context. Of course, because our uh, policies are dependent on historical data, they're essentially constructed adaptively, this gt is a random function that's measurable with respect to the history. This is in contrast to the independent setting or ID setting, where usually we think about a longing policy that's just some fixed policy of a and x. Here, it's going to be random and measurable with respect to the historical data. Then the estimator is going to be constructed as follows. We're going to construct the DR estimator by taking the so-called DR influence function, which is essentially a generalization of uh, the DR estimator we have before, now looking at generalized, uh, general weighted estimates, and we're going to take its sample mean by plugging in some estimate for the conditional uh, mean of the rewards, which is some estimate that's based only on the data so far whenever we're looking at the tth term. And then we're going to reweight it using these sigmas. And these sigmas are also something that's measurable with respect to the history so far. And what should these sigmas proxies? Well, these sigmas are trying to get at the true conditional standard deviation of the DR influence function. So if we look at the DR influence function at time t, what we care about is its conditional standard deviation given the history. Then we can show that if we have what we call a non-trivial efficiency bound, so essentially the variance of the DR influence term uh, should be positive, as it usually should be, and if we estimate these true conditional standard deviations consistently, and if our exploration uh, is diminishing only very slowly towards zero in the sense that it's, not, it's diminishing slower than one over t, then we can show that our estimator is asymptotically normal. But one of the most crucial steps here is actually coming up with these uh, conditional standard deviation estimators that are consistent. Uh, so that is where a lot of the work lies. And one of the key challenges in constructing this estimator is that we're trying to estimate the conditional variance of a random variable that we only observe once. So the trick that we use is to use a sort of meta-important sampling to important sampling the DR estimator itself in order to estimate the conditional variance using the data we have so far. So unfortunately, I don't have too much time to talk about the details of this, but the punchline is that uh, we are able to construct uh, a standard uh, deviation estimator that is consistent in the sense desired under some appropriate conditions. Um, and then the question is, well, how does this actually play out in practice? So to study this, uh, we considered 57 different classification data sets given uh, from the OpenML uh, CC18 uh, 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 corpus. And we turned each one essentially into contextual bandit instance by giving a reward for correct classification. And then we ran through these data sets many, many times uh, with different algorithms. And these data sets have different sizes, different number of classes, and different amounts of features. And then the punchline is that overall, our estimator, Cutter, when we design it to have 95% coverage, the coverage it gets, which is shown in the y-axis in each one of these plots, 
is about 95% as desired, whereas the coverage of alternative estimators shown in the x-axis of these plots uh, is varying all over the place. Right? So if we want 95% coverage, actually IPW plus minus two standard errors gives us anywhere between 25 and 75% coverage. And this uh, behavior is consistent among different settings that we, that we consider. Of course, sometimes things do break, especially when we have uh, small amounts of data or very extreme um, uh, propensities. So I'll end here and just recap uh, the takeaway messages, which is that Bandit algorithms offer a, uh, an opportunity for a lot of improvements over non-adaptive experimentation. And therefore, they're quite appealing in a lot of applied fields. But in the same fields, we also want to run inference at the end. We don't just care about collecting very little regret and collecting a lot of reward. We also want to learn something at the end. So to learn something at the end would mean to conduct inference, to support credible conclusions. The problem is that these bandit algorithms, they break statistical inference. Uh, so that's the challenge that we tackled today, and to solve it, uh, I presented this estimator they came up with, the Cutter estimator, which is the first asymptotically normal estimator under contextual adaptive data collection, right? So whenever we're actually running contextual bandits and not non-contextual bandits. And what this does is allow us to do valid statistical inference and guarantee correct coverage. Um, so I'll end here, and just thank you again for coming to my talk. Thanks.